Part 8. Freed Market Regulation, Social Activism and Spontaneous Order Regulation Red Herring – Why There's No Such Thing as an Unregulated Market Sheldon Richman, 2009 Most people believe that government must regulate the marketplace. The only alternative to a regulated market, the thinking goes, is an unregulated market. On first glance, that makes sense. It's the law of excluded middle. A market is either regulated or it's not. Cashing in on the common notion that anything unregulated is bad, advocates of government regulation argue that an unregulated market is to be abhorred. This view is captured by twin sculptures outside the Federal Trade Commission building in Washington, D.C. One is on the Constitution Avenue side, the other on the Pennsylvania Avenue side. The sculptures, which won an art contest sponsored by the U.S. government during the New Deal, depict a man using all his strength to keep a wild horse from going on a rampage. The title, Man Controlling Trade. Since trade is not really a wild horse, but rather a peaceful and mutually beneficial activity between people, the Roosevelt administration's propaganda purpose is clear. A more honest title would be Government Controlling People. But that would have sounded a little authoritarian even in New Deal America, hence the wild horse metaphor. What's overlooked, intentionally or not, is that the alternative to a government-regulated economy is not an unregulated one. As a matter of fact, unregulated economy, like square circle, is a contradiction in terms. If it's truly unregulated, it's not an economy. And if it's an economy, it's not unregulated. The term free market does not mean free of regulation, it means free of government interference. Ludwig von Mises and F. A. Hayek pointed out years ago that the real issue regarding economic planning is not to plan or not to plan, but rather who plans, centralized state officials or decentralized private individuals in the market. Likewise, the question is not to regulate or not to regulate, it is rather who or what regulates. All markets are regulated. In a free market, we all know what would happen if someone charged, say, $100 per apple. He'd sell few apples because someone else would offer to sell them for less, or pending that, consumers would switch to alternative products. The market would not permit the seller to successfully charge $100. Similarly, in a free market, employers will not succeed in offering $1 an hour, and workers will not succeed in demanding $20 an hour for a job that produces only $10 worth of output an hour. If they try, they will quickly see their mistake and learn. And again, in a free market, an employer who subjected his employees to perilous conditions without adequately compensating them to their satisfaction for the danger would lose them to competitors. What regulates the conduct of these people? Market forces. I keep specifying in a free market because in a state-regulated economy, market forces are diminished or suppressed. Economically speaking, people cannot do whatever they want in a free market because other people are free to counteract them. Just because the government doesn't stop a seller from charging $100 for an apple doesn't mean he or she can get that amount. Market forces regulate the seller as strictly as any bureaucrat could, even more so because a bureaucrat can be bribed. Whom would you have to bribe to be exempt from the law of supply and demand? It is no matter of indifference whether state operatives or market forces do the regulating. Bureaucrats who necessarily have limited knowledge and perverse incentives regulate by threat of physical force. In contrast, market forces operate peacefully through millions of participants, each with intimate knowledge of his or her own personal circumstances, looking out for their own well-being. Bureaucratic regulation is likely to be irrelevant or inimical to what people in the market care about, not so regulation by market forces. If this is correct, there can be no unregulated or unfettered markets. We use those terms in referring to markets that are unregulated or unfettered by government. As long as we know what we mean, the expressions are unobjectionable. But not everyone knows what we mean. Someone unfamiliar with the natural regularities of free markets can find the idea of an unregulated economy terrifying. So it behooves market advocates to be capable of articulately explaining the concept of spontaneous market order, that is, order, to use Adam Ferguson's felicitous phrase, that is the product of human action, but not human design. This is counterintuitive, so it takes some practice to explain it. 
order grows from market forces. But where do impersonal market forces come from? These are the result of the nature of human action. Individuals select ends and act to achieve them by adopting suitable means. Since means are scarce and ends are abundant, individuals economize in order to accomplish more rather than less. And they always seek to exchange lower values for higher values as they see them, and never the other way around. In a world of scarcity, trade-offs are unavoidable, so one aims to trade up rather than down. The result of this and other features of human action and the world at large is what we call market forces. But really, it is just men and women acting rationally in the world. The natural social order greatly concerned Frederick Bastiat, the 19th-century French liberal economist. In economic harmonies, he analyzed that order, but did not feel he needed to prove its existence. He needed only to point it out. Habit has so familiarized us with these phenomena that we never notice them until, so to speak, something sharply discordant and abnormal about them forces them to our attention. He wrote. So ingenious, so powerful, then, is the social mechanism that every man, even the humblest, obtains in one day more satisfactions than he could produce for himself in several centuries. We should be shutting our eyes to the facts if we refuse to recognize that society cannot present such complicated combinations in which civil and criminal law play so little part without being subject to a prodigiously ingenious mechanism. This mechanism is the object of study of political economy. In truth, could all this have happened? Could such extraordinary phenomena have occurred unless there were in society a natural and wise order that operates without our knowledge? This is the same lesson taught by F. E. E.'s founder Leonard Reed in *I Pencil*. Most people value order. Chaos is inimical to human flourishing. Thus, those who fail to grasp that, as Bastiat's contemporary Proudhon put it, liberty is not the daughter but the mother of order, will be tempted to favor state-imposed order. How ironic, since the state is the greatest creator of disorder of all. Those of us who understand Bastiat's teachings realize how urgent it is that others understand them too. We are market forces. Charles W. Johnson, two thousand nine. In a freed market, who will stop markets from running riot and doing crazy things? And who will stop the rich and powerful from running roughshod over everyone else? We will. Sheldon Richman recently wrote a nice piece for "The Goal Is Freedom" at the Freeman's website called "Regulation Red Herring: Why There's No Such Thing as an Unregulated Market." Footnote: Sheldon Richman, "Regulation Red Herring," Chapter Forty-Two, Pages Three Eighty-Seven to Three Ninety, in this volume. Sheldon's point, which is well taken and important, is that if regulation is being used to mean making a process orderly or regular, then what radical free marketeers advocate is not a completely unregulated market. For something to even count as a market, it has to be orderly and regular enough for people to conduct their business and make their living in it and through it. Government interference only seems necessary to regulate a market, in the positive sense of the word "regulate." If you think that the only way to get social order is by means of social control, and the only way to get harmonious social interactions is by having a government coerce people into working together with each other, but as Sheldon argues, the question is not to regulate or not to regulate; it is rather who or what regulates. All markets are regulated. What regulates the conduct of these people? Market forces, economically speaking, people cannot do whatever they want in a free market because other people are free to counteract them. Just because the government doesn't stop a seller from charging one hundred dollars for an apple doesn't mean he or she can get that amount. Market forces regulate the seller as strictly as any bureaucrat could, even more so because a bureaucrat can be bribed. Whom would you have to bribe to be exempt from the law of supply and demand? There can be no unregulated or unfettered markets. We use those terms in referring to markets that are unregulated or unfettered by government. As long as we know what we mean, the expressions are unobjectionable. But not everyone knows what we mean. Someone unfamiliar with the natural regularities of free markets can find the idea of an unregulated economy terrifying. So it behooves market advocates to be capable of articulately explaining the concept of spontaneous market order. That is the product of human action, but not human design. 
order grows from market forces. But where do impersonal market forces come from? These are the result of the nature of human action. Individuals select ends and act to achieve them by adopting suitable means. The result is what we call market forces. But really, it is just men and women acting rationally in the world. That last point is awfully important. It's convenient to talk about market forces, but you need to remember that those market forces are not supernatural entities that act on people from the outside. Market forces are a conveniently abstracted way of talking about the systematic patterns that emerge from people's economic choices. So, if the question is who will stop markets from running riot, the answer is we will. By peacefully choosing what to buy and what not to buy, where to work and where not to work, what to accept and what not to accept, we inevitably shape and order the market that surrounds us. When we argue about whether or not governments should intervene in the economy in order to regiment markets, the question is not whether markets should be made orderly and regular, but rather whether the process of ordering is in the hands of the people making the trade or by unaccountable third parties, and whether the means of ordering are going to be consensual or coercive. The one thing that I would want to add to Sheldon's excellent point is that there are two ways in which we will do the regulating of our own economic affairs in a free society, because there are two different kinds of peaceful, spontaneous orders in a self-regulating society. Footnote: See Charles Johnson, Women and the Invisible Fist, Radgeek People's Daily, No Publisher, May 16, 2008, Radgeek.com. There is the sort of spontaneity that Sheldon focuses on, the unplanned but orderly coordination that emerges as a byproduct of ordinary people's interactions. This is spontaneity in the sense of achieving a goal without a prior blueprint for the goal. But a self-regulating people can also engage in another kind of spontaneity, that is, achieving harmony and order through a conscious process of voluntary organizing and activism. This is spontaneity in the sense of achieving a goal through means freely chosen, rather than through constraints imposed. In a freed market, if someone in the market exploits workers or chisels customers, if she produces things that are degrading or dangerous, or uses methods that are environmentally destructive, it's vital to remember that you do not have to just let the market take its course, because the market is not something outside of us. We are market forces. And so, a freed market includes not only individual buyers and sellers looking to increase a bottom line, but also our shared projects, where people choose to work together by means of conscious but non-coercive activism, alongside, indeed, as a part of the undesigned forms of spontaneous self-organization that emerge. We are market forces, and the regulating in a self-regulating market is done not only by us equilibrating our prices and bids, but also by deliberately working to shift the equilibrium point by means of conscious entrepreneurial action. And one thing that libertarian principles clearly imply, even though actually existing libertarians may not stress it often enough, is that entrepreneurship includes social entrepreneurship, working to achieve non-monetary social goals. So when self-regulating workers rely on themselves and not on the state, abusive or exploitative or irresponsible bosses can be checked or plain run out of the market by the threat or the practice of strikes, of boycotts, of divestiture, and of competition—competition competition from humane and sustainable alternatives promoted by means of fair trade certifications, social investing, or other positive pro-cot measures. As long as the means are voluntary, based on free association and dissociation, the right to organize, the right to quit, and the right to put your money where your mouth is, these are all part of a freed market, no less than apple carts or corporations. When liberals or progressives wonder who would check the power of the capitalists and the bureaucratic corporations, their answer is a politically appointed, even less accountable bureaucracy. The libertarian answer is the power of the people. Organized with our fellow workers into fighting unions, strikes and slowdowns, organized boycotts, and working to develop alternative institutions like union hiring halls, grassroots mutual aid associations, free clinics, or worker and consumer co-ops. In other words, if you want regulations that check destructive corporate power, that put a stop to abuse or exploitation or the trashing of the environment, don't lobby. Organize.
where government regulators would take economic power out of the hands of the people on the belief that social order only comes from social control, freed markets put economic power into the hands of the people, and they call on us to build a self-regulating order by means of free choice and grassroots organization. When I say that the libertarian left is the real left, I mean that, and it's not because I'm revising the meaning of the term left to suit my own predilections or some obsolete French seating chart. It's because libertarianism, rightly understood, calls on the workers of the world to unite and to solve the problems of social and economic regulation not by appealing to any external authority or privileged managerial planner, but rather by taking matters into their own hands and working together, through grassroots community organizing, to build the kind of world that we want to live in. All power to the people. Platonic Productivity Roderick T. Long 2004. Women on the job market make, on average, 75 cents for every dollar men make for the equivalent jobs. What explains this wage gap? Various possibilities have been suggested, but some Austrians have argued that there is only one possible explanation. Women are less productive than men. The argument goes like this. If employers pay an employee more than the value of that worker's marginal revenue product, the company will lose money and so will be penalized by the market. If employers pay an employee less than the value of his or her marginal revenue product, then other companies can profit by offering more competitive wages and so luring the employee away. Hence, wage rates that are set either above or below the employee's marginal revenue product will tend to get whittled away via competition. See Mises and Rothbard for this argument. The result is that any persistent disparity between men's and women's wages must be due to a corresponding disparity between their marginal productivities. As Walter Block puts it, Consider a man and a woman, each with a productivity of $10 per hour, and suppose, because of discrimination or whatever, that the man is paid $10 per hour and the woman is paid $8 per hour. It is as if the woman had a little sign on her forehead saying, hire me and earn an extra $2 an hour. This makes her a desirable employee, even for a sexist boss. The fact that the wage gap does not get whittled away by competition in this fashion shows that the gap must be based, so the argument runs, on a real difference in productivity between the sexes. This does not necessarily point to any inherent difference in capacities, but might instead be due to the disproportionate burden of household work shouldered by women, which would also explain why the wage gap is greater for married women than for single women. Walter Block makes this argument also. Hence, feminist worries about the wage gap are groundless. I'm not sure why this argument, if successful, would show that worrying about the wage gap is a mistake, rather than showing that efforts to redress the gap should pay less attention to influencing employers and more attention to influencing marital norms. Perhaps the response would be that since wives freely choose to abide by such norms, outsiders have no basis for condemning the norms. But since when can't freely chosen arrangements be criticized, on moral grounds, prudential grounds, or both? But anyway, I'm not persuaded by the argument, which strikes me as more neoclassical than Austrian, in that it ignores imperfect information, the passage of time, etc., I certainly agree with Mises and Rothbard that there is a tendency for workers to be paid in accordance with their marginal revenue product, but the tendency doesn't realize itself instantaneously or without facing countervailing tendencies, and so, as I see it, does not license the inference that workers' wages are likely to approximate the value of their marginal revenue product, just as the existence of equilibrating tendencies doesn't mean the economy is going to be at or near equilibrium. I would apply to this case the observation Mises makes about the final state of rest, that although the market at every instant is moving toward a final state of rest, nevertheless this state will never be attained because new disturbing factors will emerge before it will be realized. First of all, most employers do not know with any great precision their workers' marginal revenue product. Firms are, after all, islands of central planning, on a small enough scale that the gains from central coordination generally outweigh the losses, but still they are epistemically hampered by the absence of internal markets. And I'm rather skeptical of attempts to simulate markets within the firm, a la Koch Industries. 
A firm confronts the test of profitability as a unit, not employee by employee, and so there is a fair bit of guesswork involved in paying workers according to their profitability. Precisely this point is made in another context by Block himself. Estimating the marginal revenue product of actual and potential employees is difficult to do. There are joint products. Productivity depends on how the worker fits in with others. It is impossible to keep one's eye on a given person all day long, etc. But Block thinks this doesn't much matter because those entrepreneurs who can carry out such tasks prosper; those who cannot do not. Well, true enough, but an entrepreneur doesn't have to solve those problems perfectly in order to prosper, as anyone who has spent any time in the frequently insane Dilbert-like world of actual industry can testify. The reason Dilbert is so popular is that it's so depressingly accurate. A firm that doesn't pay adequate attention to profitability is doomed to failure, certainly. But precisely because we're not living in the world of neoclassical perfect competition, firms can survive and prosper without being profit maximizers. They just have to be less crazy slash stupid than their competitors. Indeed, it's one of the glories of the market that it can produce such marvelous results from such crooked timber. Even if women are not generally less productive than men, then there might still be a widespread presumption on the part of the employers that they are. And in light of the difficulty of determining the productivity of specific individuals, this presumption would not be easily falsified, thus making any wage gap based on such a presumption more difficult for market forces to whittle away. Similar presumptions could explain the wage gap between married and single women, likewise. Hence, a wage gap might persist even if employers are focused solely on profitability, have no interest in discrimination, and are doing the level best to pay salary on marginal productivity alone. But there is no reason to rule out the possibility of deliberate profit disregarding discrimination either. Discrimination can be a consumption good for managers, and this good can be treated as part of the manager's salary and benefits package. Any costs to the company arising from the manager's discriminatory practices can thus be viewed as sheer payroll costs. Maybe some managers order fancy wood paneling for their offices, and other managers pay women less for reasons of sexism. If the former sort of behavior can survive the market test, why not the latter? I should add that I don't think my skepticism about the productivity theory of wages is any sort of criticism of the market. The tendency to which Austrian's point is real, and it means that markets are likely to get us closer to wages according to productivity than could any rival system. Since neoclassical perfect competition is incoherent and impossible, it does not count as a relevant rival. If employers have a hard time estimating their workers' productivity, the knowledge problem, or sometimes cannot be trusted to try, the incentive problem, that's no reason to suppose that government would do it any better. Employers are certainly in a better, however imperfect, position to evaluate their employees' productivity than is some distant legislator or bureaucrat, and they likewise have more reason to care about their company's profitability, even if it's not all they care about, than would the government. So there's no reason to think that transferring decision-making authority from employers to the state would bring wages into any better alignment with productivity. People in government are crooked timber too, and given economic democracy's superior efficiency in comparison with political democracy, they're even less constrained by any sort of accountability than private firms are. Nothing I've said shows that men and women are equally productive. It's only meant to show that, given prevailing cultural norms and power relations, we might well expect to see a gap between men's and women's earnings, even if they were equally productive, which is at least reason for skepticism about claims that they are not equally productive. I would also add that even if there are persistent problems, non-governmental but nonetheless harmful power relations and the like, that market processes do not eliminate automatically, it does not follow that there is nothing to be done about these problems short of a resort to governmental force. That's one reason I'm more sympathetic to the labor movement and the feminist movement than many libertarians nowadays tend to be. In the 19th century, libertarians saw political oppression as one component in an interlocking system of political, economic, and cultural factors. They made neither the mistake of thinking that political power was the only problem, nor the mistake of thinking that political power could be safely and effectively used to combat the other problems. As I've written elsewhere. As students of Austrian economics see, for example, the writings of F. A. Hayek. 
We know that the free market, by coordinating the dispersed knowledge of market actors, has the ability to come up with solutions that no individual could have devised. But as students of Austrian economics, see for example the writings of Israel Kurzner, we also know that the efficiency of markets depends in large part on the action of entrepreneurs. And on the Austrian theory, entrepreneurs do not passively react to market prices, as they do in neoclassical economics, but instead are actively alert to profit opportunities and are constantly trying to invent and market new solutions. We should remember to balance the Hayekian insight against the equally important Kurznerian insight that the working of the market depends on the creative ingenuity of individuals. I see our role as that of intellectual entrepreneurs. Our coming up with solutions is part of, though by no means the whole of, what it means for the market to come up with solutions. We are the market. Footnote. Roderick T. Long, Defending a Free Nation. Anarchy and Law, the Political Economy of Choice. Edited by Edward P. Stringham. New Brunswick, New Jersey. Transaction, 2007, page 152. We know, independently of the existence of the wage gap, that there is plenty of sexism in the business world. Those who don't know this can verify it for themselves by spending time in that world or talking with those who have done so. Once we see why the productivity theory of wages, though correct as far as it goes, goes less far than its proponents often suppose, it does not seem implausible to suppose that this sexism plays some role in explaining the wage gap, and such sexism needs to be combated. And, even if the wage gap were based on a genuine productivity gap deriving from women's greater responsibility for household work, the cultural expectations that lead women to assume such responsibility would then be the sexism to combat. But that's no reason to gripe about market failure. Such failure is merely our failure. Instead, we need to fight the power, peacefully, but not quietly. Libertarianism and Anti-Racism Sheldon Richman, 2010. Individualism abhors bigotry. Rand Paul's comments regarding the federal ban on racial discrimination in public accommodations, Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title II, have brought the libertarian position on civil rights to public attention. This is odd because Paul insists, I'm not a libertarian. It's not been an entirely comfortable experience for libertarians. For obvious reasons, libertarians are committed to freedom of association, which, of course, includes the freedom not to associate, and the right of property owners to set rules on their property. Yet, libertarians don't want to be mistaken for racists who have been known to, inconsistently, invoke property rights in defense of racial discrimination. I say inconsistently because, historically, they did not object to laws requiring segregation. Evelyn Beatrice Hall could say, summarizing Voltaire's views, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. But no libertarian I know relishes saying, I disapprove of your bigotry, but I will defend to the death your right to live by it. Yet that is the libertarian position, and we should not shrink from it. Defending the freedom of the virtuous is easy. The test is in defending it for the vicious. What I want to show here, however, is that this is not the entire libertarian position. There's more, and we do the philosophy, not to mention the cause of freedom and injustice if we leave out the rest. Let's start with the question of some controversy. Should a libertarian even care about racism? By racism here, I mean nonviolent racist acts only. I am not asking if people who are libertarians should care about racism, but rather, are there specifically libertarian grounds to care about it? Some say no, arguing that since liberty is threatened only by the initiation of physical force and fraud, nonviolent racist conduct, repugnant as it is, is not a libertarian concern. This is not to say libertarians wouldn't have other reasons to object. But I and others disagree with that claim. I think there are good libertarian grounds to abhor racism, and not only that, but also to publicly object to it and even to take peaceful but vigorous non-state actions to stop it. Libertarianism and Racism What could be a libertarian reason to oppose nonviolent racism? Charles Johnson spelled it out in The Freeman. Libertarianism is a commitment to the non-aggression principle. That principle rests on some justification. 
Thus, it is conceivable that a principle of nonviolent action, such as racism, though not involving the initiation of force and contradicting libertarianism per se, could nevertheless contradict the justification for one's libertarianism. For example, a libertarian who holds his or her philosophy out of a conviction that all men and women are, or should be, equal in authority, and thus none may subordinate another against his or her will, the most common justification, that libertarian would naturally object to even nonviolent forms of subordination. Racism is just such a form, though not the only one, since existentially it entails at least an obligatory humiliating deference by members of one racial group to members of the dominant racial group. The obligatory deference need not always be enforced by physical coercion. Seeing fellow human beings locked into a servile role, even if that role is not explicitly maintained by force, properly reflexively summons in libertarians an urge to object. I'm reminded of what H. L. Mencken said when asked what he thought of slavery. I don't like slavery because I don't like slaves. Too close to violence. Another related libertarian reason to oppose nonviolent racism is that it all too easily metamorphoses from subtle intimidation into outright violence. Even in a culture where racial places have long been established by custom and require no coercive enforcement, members of a rising generation will sooner or later defiantly reject their assigned place and demand equality of authority. What happens then? It takes little imagination to envision members of the dominant race, even if they have professed a thin libertarianism to that point, turning to physical force to protect their way of life. It should go without saying that a libertarian protest of nonviolent racist conduct must not itself be violent. Thus, a libertarian campaign against racism in public accommodations should take the form of boycotts, sit ins, and the like, rather than assault and destruction of property. And if that's the case, it follows that state action is also beyond the pale, since government is force. Hence, the libertarian objection to government bans on segregation in privately owned places. It would be a mistake, however, to think that ruling out government action would severely limit the scope of protest. As I've written elsewhere, lunch counters throughout the American South were being desegregated years before the passage of the 1964 Act. How so? Through sit ins, boycotts, and other kinds of nonviolent, non governmental, confrontational social action. Footnote See Sheldon Richman, Context Keeping and Community Organizing, Chapter 48, pages 421 to 424 in this volume. Yes, people got worthwhile things done without government help. Amazing, isn't it? Two more points in closing. First, libertarians lose credibility when they pretend to deny the obvious social distinction between a privately owned public place, such as a restaurant, and a privately owned private place, such as a home. We see this too often. A libertarian will challenge a progressive thus. If you really believe that there should be laws against whites-only restaurants, to be consistent, you should also demand laws against whites-only house parties. That's a lousy argument. When I walk past a restaurant, in the back of my mind is the thought, I can go in there. I have no such thought when I walk past a home. It's a matter of expectations reasonably derived from the function of the place. Homes and restaurants are alike in some important respects. They're privately owned, but they're also different in some important respects. Why deny that? Of course, it does not follow from this distinction that government should set the rules for the restaurant. The libertarian needs to challenge incorrect inferences from the distinction, not the distinction itself. Sit-ins and trespass. Finally, no doubt someone will have raised an eyebrow at my inclusion of sit-ins in the list of appropriate nonviolent forms of protest against racist conduct. Isn't a sit-in at a private lunch counter a trespass? It is and the students who staged the sit-ins did not resist when they were removed by the police. Sometimes they were beaten by thugs who themselves were not subjected to police action. The students never forced their way into any establishment. They simply entered, sat well-behaved at the counter, and waited to be served. When told they would not be served, they said through their actions, You can remove me, but I will not help you. Actually, blacks could shop at Woolworths and similar stores, they just couldn't sit at the lunch counters. Boycotts hurt the store's bottom lines. I could buttress this defense of sit-ins by pointing out that those stores were not operating in a free and competitive market. 
An entrepreneur who tried to open an integrated lunch counter across the street from Woolworths likely would have been thwarted by zoning, licensing, and building inspection officers. He would have had a hard time buying supplies and equipment because the local White Citizens Council, the respectable white-collar bigots, would have suggested to wholesalers that doing business with the integrationist might be, shall we say, ill-advised. And if the message needed to be underscored, the Ku Klux Klan, with government's implicit sanction and even participation, was always available for late-night calls. Did the beneficiaries of that oppressive system really have a good trespass case against the sit-in participants? Aggression and the Environment Mary Ruart, 2003 We are more likely to protect the environment when we own a piece of it and profit by nurturing it. In this chapter, we'll learn how third-layer aggression harms the environment and increases costs of many important services. With third-layer aggression, we are forced, at gunpoint if necessary, to subsidize the exclusive monopolies created by second-layer aggression even if we don't use them. Of course, we can be forced to subsidize service providers who do not have an exclusive monopoly. In real life, the layers of aggression that create the pyramid of power may change order from time to time. What doesn't change is that each additional layer of aggression decreases our choices and increases our costs. Encouraging Waste Whenever people do not pay the full cost of something they use, they have less incentive to conserve. For example, when people pay the same amount of taxes for solid waste disposal whether they recycle or not, fewer people are inclined to recycle. As a consequence, we have more waste and disposal problems. Conversely, when subsidies decrease, conservation automatically follows. In Seattle, during the first year that customers were charged by the volume of trash they generated, 67% chose to become involved in the local recycling program. Footnote, Lynn Scarlett, Managing America's Garbage, Alternatives and Solutions, Reason Foundation Policy Study 115, Santa Monica, California, Reason, September 1989. Because about 18% of our yearly trash consists of leaves, grass, and other yard products, composting coupled with recycling can dramatically lower a person's disposal bill. Footnote, Janet Marinelli, Composting, From Backyards to Big Time, Garbage, July to August, 1990, pages 44 to 51. As less waste is generated, fewer resources are needed to dispose of it. What could be more natural? Discouraging Conservation Water utilities are usually public monopolies subsidized by our tax dollars. In California's San Joaquin Valley, 4.5 million acres of once desert farmland is irrigated by subsidized water. Taxes are used to construct dams for irrigators, pay many of their delivery costs, and support zero-interest loans to farmers who pay only a tenth of what residential customers do. Footnote Randall R. Rucker and Price V. Fishback, The Federal Reclamation Program, An Analysis of Rent-Seeking Behavior, in Water Rights, edited by Terry L. Anderson, San Francisco, Pacific, 1983, pages 62 to 63. These subsidies encourage wasteful over-irrigation, resulting in soil erosion, salt buildup, and toxic levels of selenium in the runoff. Kesterson Wildlife Reservoir has been virtually destroyed by irrigation-induced selenium buildup, which now threatens San Francisco Bay as well. Footnote, Terry L. Anderson and Donald R. Leal, Free Market Environmentalism, A Property Rights Approach, San Francisco, Pacific, 1990, pages 55 to 56. As long as our tax dollars subsidize the irrigators, however, they have little financial incentive to install drip sprinkler systems or other conservation devices. As a result, less water is available for other uses, so prices increase for everyone else. Without subsidies, irrigators would be motivated to conserve, making more water available for domestic use. Destroying the Environment the above examples of third-layer aggression deal solely with exclusive monopolies, where service is provided by a public works department, subsidized in whole or in part by taxes. Subsidies also go to maintain the federal and state lands, which encompass over 40% of the U.S. landmass, including nearly all of Alaska and Nevada. Footnote, 
John Baden, Destroying the Environment, Government Mismanagement of Our Natural Resources, Dallas, Texas, National Center for Policy Analysis, 1986, pages 20 to 21. And footnote, Baden, page 38. Land ownership is not an exclusive government monopoly, but the sheer size of the government's holdings, and the subsidies necessary for maintaining them, allow us to treat them as a product of third-layer aggression. Rather than exclusive licensing, aggression through government takes the form of forcible prevention of homesteading. Lands in the United States were originally settled by homesteading, a time-honored way of creating wealth. Individuals or groups find unused land and clear it for agriculture, fence it for grazing, make paths for hiking, build a home, and so on. To own the new wealth, farmland, ranch land, etc., that they have made, creators lay claim to the property on which it resides. When others settle nearby, they choose different property on which to stake their claim. Government holds land by forcibly preventing homesteading. Sometimes we condone this aggression to protect rangeland, forests, and parks from abuse and destruction. By using aggression as our means, however, we endanger the ends that we seek. Overgrazing the Range The incentives of the congressional representatives who oversee the U.S. Bureau of Land Management are very different from individual landowners. The following imaginary conversation between a congressman and some of his constituents illustrates the dilemma that our sincere lawmakers have. Mr. Congressman, we represent the ranchers in your district. Things are pretty tough for us right now, but you can help us. Let us graze cattle on all that vacant range land the government has in this area. We'll be properly grateful when it comes time to contribute to your campaign. As a token of our goodwill, we'll make a substantial donation just as soon as we come to an agreement. The congressman has twinges of conscience. He knows that the ranchers will overstock the government ranges, even though they carefully control the number of cattle on their own land. Since they can't be sure of having the same public range every year, however, they cannot profit by taking care of it. They cannot pass it on to their children. They profit most by letting their cattle eat every last blade of grass. When the congressman shares his concern with the ranchers, they respond with, Mr. Congressman, we will pay a small fee for renting the land. Renters don't take as good care of property as owners do, it's true, but the land is just sitting there helping no one. People who want to save the land for their children and grandchildren must not have the problems we do just keeping our next generation fed. If you don't help us, sir, you'll have trouble putting food on your table, too. We'll find someone to run against you who knows how to take care of the people he or she represents. We'll make sure that you're defeated. The congressman sighs and gives in. After all, the ranchers gain immensely if allowed to graze cattle on the land he controls. They have every incentive to make good their threats and their promises. The person they help elect might not even try to protect the environment. The congressman reasons that he should give a little on this issue so that he, not some yes-man, can remain in office. The congressman finds that his colleagues have constituents who want the government to build a dam on public land or harvest the national forests. He agrees to vote for these programs in return for their help in directing the Bureau of Land Management to rent the grazing land to his ranchers. Naturally, these changes set precedents for many of the resources controlled by the government, not just the ones in this congressman's district. Because of these skewed incentives, almost half of our public rangelands are rented out to ranchers for grazing cattle at one-fifth to one-tenth of the rate of private land. Footnote, Ronald M. Latimer, Chained to the Bottom, Bureaucracy vs. Environment, edited by John Baden and Richard L. Stroop, Ann Arbor, Michigan, University of Michigan Press, 1981, page 156. By 1964, three million additional acres had been cleared with environmentally destructive practices, such as chaining, to create more rentable rangeland. Footnote, Baden, page 18. Because the ranchers and their representatives cannot profit by protecting the land, they have little incentive to do so. As early as 1925, studies demonstrated the inevitable result. On overgrazed public ranges, cattle were twice as likely to die and had half as many calves as animals raised on private lands. Footnote, Gary D. Leibcap, Locking Up the Range, San Francisco, Pacific, 1981, page 27. Are the ranchers and their representatives selfish others whom we should condemn for overgrazing the range? Not at all. 
Had ranchers been permitted to homestead these lands in the first place, the rangeland would now be receiving the better care characteristic of private grazing. Our willingness to use aggression to prevent homesteading has taken the profit out of caring for the environment. When this aggression is even partially removed, the environment greatly improves. For example, in 1934, Congress passed the Taylor Grazing Act to encourage ranchers to care for the public grazing land. By allowing 10-year transferable leases, ranchers had control of the land for a decade. Ranchers who improved the land were given the positive feedback of good grazing or a good price when selling their lease. In essence, the lease gave them partial ownership. As a result, almost half of the rangeland classified as poor was upgraded. Footnote, Libcap, page 46. However, in 1966, leases were reduced to only one year, giving ranchers little incentive to make improvements. After all, they could not be sure that they would be able to renew their lease. As a result, private investment in wells and fences in the early 1970s dropped to less than a third of their 1960s level. Footnote, Libcap, page 76. When vast tracts of public property are misused, the environment can suffer great damage. Overgrazing of public rangeland was permanently destructive in many cases, contributing to the formation of a dust bowl in the Midwestern states. Footnote, Murray and Rothbard, For a New Liberty, New York, Macmillan, 1973, page 264. Logging the Forests As subsidies increase, so does environmental destruction. Most of the trees in our national forests wouldn't be logged without subsidies because the cost of building the roads necessary to transport the timber exceeds the value of the lumber. Once again, however, the special interests found a way to use the aggression of taxes to their own advantage. Let's listen to an imaginary conversation between the timber companies and their congresswoman. Ms. Congresswoman, the Forest Service has money in its budget for hiking trails. Now, we're all for hiking. We just think we should get our fair share of the forest and our fair share of the subsidy. Some of that money for trails should be used to build logging roads. Consumers will benefit by increases in the supply of timber. We'd profit, too, and see that you got your fair share for your campaign chest. We'd pay some money for replanting, too, so the environmentalists will be happy. The congresswoman considers their offer. She knows that the loggers, like the ranchers, have little incentive to log sustainably on public lands. She also knows that if the hikers complain, she can ask Congress for a larger subsidy so that the Forest Service can build more trails. Some of that subsidy can be siphoned off to build more logging roads. More logging roads mean more campaign contributions. Since hikers don't make money off the forests, they won't help her out the way that loggers will. The congresswoman won't protect the forests by fighting the loggers. Special interests reap high profits with subsidies, so they'll spend large amounts of money to protect them. If the congresswoman doesn't agree to the timber company's demands, they'll put their considerable money and influence behind her opponent. The timber companies will be able to log the forests. The only question is which congressional representative will reap a share of the profits. The congresswoman sighs and agrees to fight for more logging subsidies. As a result of subsidies' adverse influence, the Forest Service uses taxpayer dollars to log the national forests. By 1985, almost 350,000 miles of logging roads had been constructed in the national forests, eight times more than the total mileage of the U.S. interstate highway system. Footnote, Peter Kirby and William Arthur, Our National Forests, Land in Peril, Washington, D.C., Wilderness Society, Sierra Club, 1985, page 4. Construction of roads requires stripping mountainous terrain of its vegetation, causing massive erosion. In the northern Rockies, trout and salmon streams are threatened by the resulting silt. Fragile ecosystems are disturbed. Footnote, Baden, page 10. The Forest Service typically receives 20 cents for every dollar spent on roads, lodging, and timber management. Footnote, Thomas Barlow, Gloria E. Helfand, Trent W. Orr, and Thomas B. Stoll, Jr., Giving Away the National Forests, New York, NRDC, 1980, Appendix 1. Even though the timber companies are charged for the cost of reforestation, 50% of these funds go for overhead. Footnote, Baden, page 14. 
Between 1991 and 1994, $1 billion more in taxes were spent to log the national forests than the loggers paid. Footnote, Edmund Kentosky, Makers and Takers, How Wealth and Progress Are Made and How They Are Taken Away or Prevented. Minneapolis, Minnesota, American Liberty, 1997, page 305. Although logging is encouraged, hiking is discouraged. The number of backpackers increased by a factor of 10 between the 1940s and the 1980s, but trails in the national forests dropped from 144,000 miles to under 100,000. Footnote, Catherine Barton and Witt Fosberg, Audubon Wildlife Report, 1986, New York, Audubon, 1986, page 129. Should we blame the timber companies and their congressional representatives for this travesty? Hardly. After all, if we sanction aggression to prevent homesteading, we take the profit out of protecting the forest. While national forests are being depleted through special interest subsidies, trees on private property are flourishing. In the United States, 85% of new tree plantings are made on private lands. In Western Europe, private plantings increased forest cover by 30% between 1971 and 1990. Footnote, Kontoski, page 302. The largest private U.S. landowner, International Paper, carefully balances public recreation, for example backpacking, with logging. In the Southeast, 25% of its profit is from recreation. Footnote, Terry L. Anderson and Donald R. Leal, Rekindling the Privatization Fires, Political Lands Revisited. Federal Privatization Project, Issue Paper 108, Santa Monica, California, Reason, 1989, page 12. Industry grows 13% more timber than it cuts in order to prepare for future needs and increase future profits. Footnote, Kontoski, page 302. When we honor the choices of others, the desire for profit works hand-in-hand -hand with sustainable environmental activities. Slaughtering Wildlife Governments often prevent individuals from claiming wildlife just as they prevent homesteading on land. In essence, wildlife management has become a public monopoly. Tax subsidies to manage wildlife give it the characteristics of third-layer aggression. Subsidies have often paid for the killing of wildlife, sometimes to the point of near extinction. State governments encouraged the shooting of hawks. Some, like Pennsylvania, paid hunters a tax-subsidized bounty. Aghast at this slaughter, Mrs. Rosalie Edge bought one of the hunter's favorite spots with voluntary contributions from like-minded people and turned it into a sanctuary. Hawk Mountain in the Pennsylvania Appalachians has been protecting hawks since 1934. Footnote, Special Report, The Public Benefits of Private Conservation, Environmental Quality, 15th Annual Report on the Council of Environmental Quality together with the President's Message to Congress. Washington, D.C., GPO, 1984, pages 387 to 394. In 1927, the owners of Sea Lion Caves, the only known mainland breeding and wintering area of the stellar sea lion, opened it to visitors as a naturalist attraction. Footnote, Special Report, pages 394 to 398. Meanwhile, Oregon's tax dollars went to bounty hunters who were paid to shoot sea lions. The owners of Sea Lion Caves spent much of their time chasing hunters off their property. Although the owners of Sea Lion Caves and Hawk Mountain Sanctuary were protecting the wildlife on their land, they were also forced to pay the taxes that rewarded hunters who endangered it. Not everyone in a group wants resources treated in the same way. When all people use their property as they think best, one owner's careless decision is unlikely to threaten the entire ecosystem. When bureaucrats control vast areas, however, one mistake can mean ecological disaster. In addition, special interest groups struggle for control. For example, Yellowstone National Park, the crown jewel of the national park system, has been torn apart by conflicts of interest. In 1915, the Park Service decided to eradicate the Yellowstone wolves, which were deemed to be a menace to the elk, deer, antelope, and mountain sheep that visitors like to see. Footnote, Tom McNamee, Yellowstone's Missing Element, Audubon, 88.1, 1986, pages 12 to 19. Park officials induced employees to trap wolves by allowing them to keep or sell the hides. Eventually, the fox, lynx, marten, and fisher were added to the list. Footnote, 
Alston Chase, Playing God in Yellowstone, The Destruction of America's Finest National Park. Boston, Mariner Hewton, 1987, pages 123 to 124. Without predators, the hoofed mammals flourished and began to compete with each other for food. The larger elk eventually drove out the white-tailed deer, the mule deer, the bighorn sheep, and the pronghorn. As their numbers increased, the elk ate the willow and aspen around the riverbanks and trampled the area so that seedlings could not regenerate. Without the willow and aspen, the beaver population dwindled. Without the beavers and the ponds they created, waterfowl, mink, and otter were threatened. The clear water needed by the trout disappeared along with the beaver dams. Without the ponds, the water table was lowered, decreasing the vegetation growth required to sustain many other species. When park officials realized their mistake, they began removing the elk, 58,000 between 1935 and 1961. Footnote, Chase, pages 12, 28, and 29. Meanwhile, the elk overgrazed, greatly reducing the shrubs and berries that fed the bear population. In addition, the destruction of willow and aspen destroyed the grizzly habitat, while road construction and beaver loss reduced the trout population on which the grizzlies fed. When the garbage dumps were closed in the 1960s to encourage the bears to feed naturally, little was left for them to eat. They began seeking out park visitors who brought food with them. Yellowstone management began a program to remove the problem bears as well. In the early 1970s, more than 100 bears were removed. Almost twice as many grizzlies were killed. Footnote, Chase, page 155 and 173. Subsidies create tension between special interests with different views. Yellowstone visitors wanted to see deer and elk. Some naturalists would have preferred not to disturb the ecosystem, even if it meant limiting visitors and disappointing some of them. Since everyone is forced to subsidize the park, each person tries to impose his or her view as to how it should be run. The resulting compromise pleases no one. Contributors to private conservation organizations, in contrast, choose to donate to a group that shares their common purpose. For example, at Pine Butte Preserve, the Nature Conservancy replanted overgrazed areas with chokecherry shrubs for the grizzlies and fenced off sensitive areas from cattle, deer, and elk, animals that thrive in the absence of predators. Footnote, Tom Blood, Men, Elk, and Wolves, The Yellowstone Primer, Land and Resource Management in the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, edited by John A. Baden and Donald Leal, San Francisco, Pacific, 1990, page 109. The Nature Conservancy has preserved more than 2.4 million acres of land since 1951. Footnote, Special Report, page 368. The Audubon Society also uses ownership to protect the environment. The Rainy Wildlife Sanctuary in Louisiana is home to marshland deer, armadillo, muskrat, otter, mink, and snow geese. Carefully managed natural gas wells and cattle herds create wealth without interfering with the native species. Footnote, Richard L. Stroop and John A. Baden, Natural Resources, Bureaucratic Myths and Environmental Management. San Francisco, Pacific, 1983, pages 49 to 50. Other private organizations investing in wilderness areas for their voluntary membership include Ducks Unlimited, the National Wild Turkey Federation, the National Wildlife Federation, Trout Unlimited, and Wings Over Wisconsin. The story of Ravina Park, Seattle, illustrates how aggression compromises the care given to the environment. In 1887, a couple bought up the land on which some giant Douglas firs grew, added a pavilion for nature lectures, and made walking paths with benches and totems depicting Indian culture. Visitors were charged admission to support Ravina Park. Up to 10,000 people came on the busiest days. Some Seattle citizens weren't satisfied with this non-aggressive arrangement. They lobbied for the city to buy and operate the park with tax dollars, taken at gunpoint if necessary. In 1911, the city took over the park, and one by one, the giant fir trees began to disappear. Concerned citizens complained when they found that the trees were being cut into cordwood and sold. The superintendent, later charged with abuse of public funds, equipment, and personnel, told the citizens that the large Roosevelt tree had posed a threat to public safety. By 1925, all the giant fir trees were gone. Footnote, Anderson and Leal, pages 51 to 52. 
The superintendent could personally profit from the beautiful trees only by selling them, not by protecting them. Power corrupts. The above example succinctly illustrates the dangers of third-layer aggression. Subsidies give bureaucrats the power to trade public assets for personal gain. Unlike the personal power that comes from wisdom, inner growth, and hard work, this power comes from the point of a gun. This power of aggression corrupts those who use it, impoverishes those who have little, and destroys the earth that supports us. The Clean Water Act versus Clean Water. Charles W. Johnson, 2010. Market anarchists probably haven't written about the environment as much as we should, but not because we don't have anything to say about it. When we do address environmental issues specifically, one of the things that I think market anarchists really have contributed to the discussion are some key points about how ex-ante environmental laws intended to curb pollution and other forms of environmental damage make some superficial reforms, but at the expense of creating a legal framework for big polluters to immunize themselves from responsibility for the damage they continue to cause to people's health and homes, or to the natural resources that people use from day to day and, also, how legislative environmentalism in general tends to crowd out freed market methods for punishing polluters and rewarding sustainable modes of production. Footnote. For example, see Kevin A. Carson, Monbio, One Step Back, Mutualist Blog, Free Market Anti-Capitalism, No Publisher, January 1st, 2006, mutualist.blogspot.com. Kevin A. Carson, Fred Foldberry on Green Taxes, Mutualist Blog, Free Market Anti-Capitalism, No Publisher, February 22, 2005, Mutualist.blogspot.com. Charles W. Johnson, Left Libertarian Engagement, Rad Geek People's Daily, No Publisher, November 25, 2008, RadGeek.com. For a perfect illustration of how legislative environmentalism is actively hurting environmental action, check out this short item in the Dispatches section of the May 2010 Atlantic. The story is about toxic mine runoff in Colorado and describes how statist anti-pollution laws are stopping small local environmental groups from actually taking direct, simple steps toward containing the lethal pollution that is constantly running into their community's rivers. Also, how big national environmental groups are lobbying hard to make sure that the smaller grassroots environmental groups keep getting blocked by the feds. Near Silverton, the problem became bad enough to galvanize landowners, miners, environmentalists, and local officials into a volunteer effort to address the drainage. With a few relatively simple and inexpensive fixes, such as concrete plugs for mine portals and artificial wetlands that absorb mine waste, the Silverton volunteers say they could further reduce the amount of acid mine drainage flowing into local rivers. In some cases, it would be simple enough just to go up there with a shovel and redirect the water, says William Simon, a former Berkeley ecology professor who has spent much of the past 15 years leading cleanup projects. But as these volunteers prepare to tackle the main source of the pollution, the mines themselves, they face an unexpected obstacle, the Clean Water Act. Under federal law, anyone wanting to clean up water flowing from a hard rock mine must bring it up to the Act's stringent water quality standards and take responsibility for containing the pollution forever. Would-be do-gooders become the legal operators of abandoned mines like those near Silverton, and therefore liable for their condition. Footnote, Michelle Nihuis, Shafted, The Atlantic, Atlantic Media Company, May 2010, theatlantic.com. Under anything resembling principles of justice, people ought to be held responsible for the damage they cause, not for the problems that remain after they try to repair damage caused by somebody else now long gone. But the basic problem with the Clean Water Act, like all statist environmental regulations, is that it isn't about standards of justice. It's about compliance with regulatory standards. And from the standpoint of an environmental regulator, the important thing is, one, that government has to be able to single out somebody or some group to pigeonhole as the people in charge of the site, and two, 
Whoever gets tagged as taking charge of the site, therefore, gets put on the hook for meeting the predetermined standards or for facing the predetermined penalties, no matter what the facts of the particular case and no matter the fact that they didn't do anything to cause the existing damage. Footnote. Ex ante regulation, by definition, isn't about looking at particular cases, and it isn't about looking back to who caused what. It's about identifying, licensing, controlling, and penalizing agents according to the situation right now. That sounds all progressive and forward looking and practical until you realize that the direct effect is to make sure that nobody who gives a damn about their community is able to afford to take responsibility for dealing with pre existing damage. All kinds of positive action get burned out, and all that's left are cash strapped, overworked government programs, which can proceed because government has made up the doctrine of sovereign immunity in order to protect its own enterprises from being held legally responsible for anything. The obvious response to this should be to repeal the clause of the Clean Water Act, which creates this insane condition, and leave the people with a stake in the community free to take positive action. Unfortunately, the best that government legislators can think of is to pass a new law to legalize it, i.e., to create yet another damn bureaucratic permit so that shoestring budget community groups can spend all their time filling out paperwork and reporting back to the EPA instead. Meanwhile, the state of the debate being what it is, even this weak, hyper bureaucratic solution is being opposed by the lobbying arms of several national environmental groups. In mid October, Senator Mark Udall of Colorado introduced a bill that would allow such Good Samaritans to obtain, under the Clean Water Act, special mine cleanup permits that would protect them from some liability. Previous Good Samaritan bills have met opposition from national environmental organizations, including the Sierra Club, the National Resources Defense Council, and even the American Bird Conservancy, for whom any weakening of the Clean Water Act standards is anathema. Although Udall's bill is narrower in scope than past proposals, some environmental groups still say the abandoned mine problem should instead be solved with additional regulation of the mining industry and more federal money for cleanup projects. If you support cleaning up the environment, why would you support cleaning up something halfway? asks Natalie Roy, executive director of the Clean Water Network, a coalition of more than 1,250 environmental and other public interest groups. It makes no sense. Footnote Nihui. All of which perfectly illustrates two of the points that I keep trying to make about anarchy and practicality. Statists constantly tell us that, nice as airy fairy anarchist theory may be, we have to deal with the real world. But down in the real world, walloping on the tar baby of electoral politics constantly gets big progressive lobbying groups stuck in ridiculous fights that elevate procedural details and purely symbolic victories above the practical success of the goals the politicking was supposedly for. To hell with clean water in Silverton, Colorado, when there's a federal clean water act to be saved. And secondly, how governmental politics systematically destroys any opportunity for progress on the margin, where positive direct action by people in the community could save a river from lethal toxins tomorrow if government would just get its guns out of their faces. Government action takes years to pass, years to implement, and never addresses anything until it's just about ready to address everything. Thus, Executive Director Natalie Roy, on behalf of more than 1,250 environmental and other public interest groups, is explicitly baffled by the notion that people who live by these rivers might not have time to hold out for the decisive blow in winning some all or nothing struggle in the national legislature. The near term prospects of Udall's half hearted legalization bill don't look good. The conclusion from The Atlantic is despair. The Silverton volunteers aren't expecting a federal windfall anytime soon. Even Superfund designated mine sites have waited years for cleanup funding, and Udall's bill has been held up in a Senate committee since last fall. Without a Good Samaritan provision to protect them from liability, they have few choices but to watch the Red and Bonita and the rest of their local mines continue to drain. Footnote Nihui. But I think if you realize that the problem is built in structurally to electoral politics, the response doesn't need to be despair. It can be motivation. 
Instead of sitting around watching their rivers die and waiting for Senator Mark Udall of Colorado to pass a bill to legalize their direct action, what I'd suggest is that the local environmental groups in Colorado stop caring so much about what's legal and what's illegal, consider some counter-economic direct action alternatives to governmental policies, and perform some guerrilla public service. I mean, look, if there are places where it would be simple enough just to go up there with a shovel and redirect the water, then wait until nightfall, get yourself a shovel, and go up there. Take a flashlight and some bolt cutters if you need them. Cement plugs no doubt take more time, but you'd be surprised what a dedicated crew can accomplish in a few hours or a few nights running. If you do it yourself, without identifying yourself, and without asking for permission, the EPA doesn't need to know about it, and the Clean Water Act can't do anything to punish you for your halfway cleanup. The Colorado rivers don't need political parties, permits, or public interest groups. What they need are some good, honest outlaws, and some black and green market entrepreneurship. Context Keeping and Community Organizing Sheldon Richmond, 2010. The strongest libertarian case I can imagine for Title II of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the provision against racial discrimination in public accommodations, rests on the key point, which I fully embrace, that the southern states operated the equivalent of a white supremacist cartel in restaurants and hotels. Before explaining my criticism of Title II, I'd like to elaborate on this point. Standard libertarian criticism of Title II appears to treat the targeted restaurants and hotels as purely private businesses that, however odious their racial policies, were unjustifiably imposed on by government policies that violated private property rights. But this account misses something crucial. Outwardly, those businesses looked like private enterprises, but the substance was different. The social-legal environment in the pre-1964 South, when Jim Crow reigned, was hardly what any libertarian would envision as a laissez-faire environment. Rather, the region was in the grip of a pervasive social system based on white supremacy, one enforced by formal government rules, discretionary official decision-making, and extra-legal measures, ranging from social pressure all the way to violence that was countenanced and even participated in by government officials. A racially liberal entrepreneur who sought to compete next door to a segregated restaurant in the downtown of a southern city would have been in for a difficult time. How would the city's zoning, licensing, and building code authorities have reacted? How inclined would they have been to find myriad reasons why the restaurant wasn't qualified to operate? Assuming that the restaurateur overcame these obstacles, mightn't he have had trouble buying equipment and food from suppliers once they had been visited by the local White Citizens Council, sometimes known as the White Collar Clan? The WCC might also have had something to say to prospective employees. If that form of persuasion didn't suffice, the actual Ku Klux Klan would have been available for nocturnal assignments. Property damage and physical intimidation might have been used to persuade the agitator not to upset the town's way of life, which up until then was perfectly satisfactory. No need to call the cops, they were probably there already. Any libertarian would object if a municipal fire department had a policy of ignoring burning homes in the black part of town. If the municipality contracted out its firefighting services to a private company with the same racial policy, libertarians would similarly object on grounds of equality under the law. They would not be fooled by the mere facade of private enterprise. Form does not alter substance. But that would also be true for the white supremacist cartels that operated public accommodations throughout the South, so libertarians should not regard those businesses as mere private enterprises. The key to understanding this matter is what libertarian scholar Chris Matthew Shiabara calls dialectics, or context-keeping. As he wrote in The Freeman, Society is not some ineffable organism. It is a complex nexus of interrelated institutions and processes, of volitionally conscious, purposeful interacting individuals, and the unintended consequences they generate. Thus, dialectics counsels us to study the object of our inquiry from a variety of perspectives and levels of generality, so as to gain a more comprehensive picture of it. That study often requires that we grasp the object in terms of the larger system within which it is situated, as well as its development across time. Emphasis added. 
Applying Shiabara's principle, we can see that racial discrimination at particular private southern lunch counters and hotels before 1964 cannot be judged apart from the larger system within which it is situated. The full context must be kept in view. Ironically, an example of dialectical thinking, albeit applied to bank regulation, is provided by Representative Ron Paul, father of Rand Paul, whose rejection, before his acceptance, of Title II prompted the recent controversy. In 1999, the elder Paul opposed repeal of a key section of the New Deal-era Glass-Steagall Act, which separated commercial from investment banking. Considering Ron Paul's commitment to a free market, his opposition to repeal of an intervention might seem illogical. Yet, he opposed it because this increased indication of the government's eagerness to bail out highly leveraged, risky, and largely unregulated financial institutions bodes ill for the future as far as limiting taxpayer liability is concerned. Paul was thinking dialectically. Removing a restriction from a form of business that enjoys government privilege is not necessarily a libertarian move. Context is crucial. By the same token, imposing a restriction on a form of business that enjoys government privileges is not necessarily an unlibertarian move. Again, context is crucial. So, does this mean that Professor Bernstein is right that libertarians ought to have supported Title II in 1964? I don't think so. Professor David Bernstein of George Mason University Law School is one libertarian who accepts Title II only because a massive federal takeover of local government to prevent violence and threats against and extra-legal harassment of those who chose to integrate would have been completely impractical. Footnote, David E. Bernstein, Context Matters, A Better Libertarian Approach to Anti-Discrimination Law. Cato Unbound, Cato Institute, June 16, 2010. Undoubtedly so. But why does that exhaust the options? Why assume government is the only salvation? That's an odd position indeed for a libertarian. Professor Bernstein does not so much as mention another strategy for ending racial discrimination in public accommodations, direct, nonviolent social action by the people affected and those in sympathy with them. We can't dismiss that as impractical because it had been working several years before Title II was enacted. Beginning in 1960, sit-ins and other Gandhi-style confrontations were desegregating department store lunch counters throughout the South. No laws had to be passed or repealed. Social pressure, the public shaming of bigots, was working. Even earlier, during the 1950s, David Beto and Linda Royster Beto report in Black Maverick, black entrepreneur T.R.M. Howard led a boycott of national gasoline companies that forced their franchises to allow blacks to use the restrooms from which they had long been barred. It is sometimes argued that Title II was an efficient remedy because it affected all businesses in one fell swoop. But the social movement was also efficient. Whole groups of offenders would relent at one time after an intense sit-in campaign. There was no need to win over one lunch counter at a time. Title II, in other words, was unnecessary. But worse, it was detrimental. History's greatest victories for liberty were achieved not through lobbying, legislation, and litigation, not through legal briefs and philosophical treatises, but through the sort of direct people's struggle that marked the Middle Ages and beyond. As a mentor of mine says, what is given like a gift can be more easily taken away, while what one secures for oneself by facing down power is less easily lost. The social campaign for equality that was desegregating the South was transmogrified when it was diverted to Washington. Focus then shifted from the grassroots to a patronizing white political elite in Washington that had scurried to the front of the march and claimed leadership. Recall Hillary Clinton's belittling of the grassroots movement when she ran against Barack Obama. Dr. King's dream began to be realized when President Lyndon Johnson passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It took a president to get it done. We will never know how the original movement would have evolved. What independent mutual aid institutions would have emerged had that division not occurred? We do know, as Professor Bernstein reminds us, that Title II became a precedent for laws forbidding all types of private discrimination that were in no way rooted in government-sanctioned cartels. 
Bernstein may see the South's social system as providing a limited principle for when anti-discrimination laws are permissible, but this overlooks the perverse dynamic of the political world. Simply put, after 1964, there was just no way that anti-discrimination laws were going to be confined to Jim Crow-type cases. Libertarians need not shy away from the question, do you mean that whites should have been allowed to exclude blacks from their lunch counters? Libertarians can answer proudly, no, they should not have been allowed to do that. They should have been stopped, not by the state, which can't be trusted, but by nonviolent social action on behalf of equality. The libertarian answer to bigotry is community organizing. Contributors Benjamin Tucker was the dean of 19th century American individualist anarchists. He served as editor of the influential anarchist periodical Liberty. Many of his essays are collected in Instead of a Book by a Man Too Busy to Write One, 1897. The text of Liberty is available online. See travelinginliberty.blogspot.com for an index. Brad Spangler is the director of the Center for a Stateless Society, www.c4ss.org. Charles Johnson is an individualist anarchist living and working in Auburn, Alabama. He is a research associate at the Molinari Institute, a member of the Industrial Workers of the World, and an alumnus of Auburn University. He has published the Rad Geek People's Daily web blog at radgeek.com since 2001 and is a frequent speaker and columnist on topics in market anarchism, stateless social activism, and the philosophy of anarchism. He can be reached through his website, charleswjohnson.name. Dyer Lum was an anarchist theorist and campaigner. He briefly edited The Alarm, 1892-1893. A radical labor activist and sometime partner of Voltaire de Clare, he was the author of books on Mormonism, trade unionism, and anarchism, notably The Economics of Anarchy, 1890. Gary Chartier is Associate Dean of the School of Business and Associate Professor of Law and Business Ethics at La Sierra University. He holds a Ph.D. from the University of Cambridge and a J.D. from the University of California at Los Angeles. He is the author of over 30 scholarly articles in publications including the Oxford Journal of Legal Studies, Legal Theory, the Canadian Journal of Law and Jurisprudence, and The Law and Philosophy, and of three books, The Analogy of Love, 2007, Economic Justice and Natural Law, 2009, and The Conscience of an Anarchist, 2011. He is a member of the Alliance of the Libertarian Left and of the advisory boards of the Center for a Stateless Society and the Moorfield Story Institute. He blogs at liberallaw.blogspot.com. Jeremy Wayland is a software developer and activist in Richmond, Virginia. He holds a bachelor's degree in computer science and German from Mary Washington College and maintains the websites socialmemory-complex.net and leftlibertarian.org. Joe Peacott is a contemporary individualist anarchist. Formerly an active member of the Boston Anarchist Drinking Brigade, he now resides in Alaska. Joseph R. Stromberg is an independent historian whose work is concerned with a broad range of issues related to state power. Carl Hess was an influential anarchist theorist and activist and a vocal proponent of local empowerment. A former speechwriter for U.S. Senator Barry Goldwater, he became associated with the New Left in the mid-1960s. He was the author or co-author of books including Dear America, 1975, The End of the Draft, The Feasibility of Freedom, 1970, Neighborhood Power, The New Localism, 1975, Community Technology, 1979, A Common Sense Strategy for Survivalists, 1981, and Mostly on the Edge, 1999. Kevin A. Carson is a research associate at the Center for a Stateless Society. He is the author of Organization Theory, a Libertarian Perspective, 2008, Studies in Mutualist Political Economy, 2007, the focus of a symposium published in the Journal of Libertarian Studies, and The Homebrew Industrial Revolution, 2009, as well as of the pamphlets Austrian and Marxist Theories of Monopoly Capital, Contract Feudalism, a Critique of Employer Power Over Employees, The Ethics of Labor Struggle, 
and The Iron Fist Behind the Invisible Hand, Corporate Capitalism as a State-Guaranteed System of Privilege. His writing has also appeared in Just Things, Anytime Now, The Freeman, Ideas on Liberty, and Land and Liberty, as well as on the P2P Foundation blog. A member of the Industrial Workers of the World, the Voluntary Cooperation Movement, and the Alliance of the Libertarian Left, and a leader in the contemporary revival of Proudhonian mutualist anarchism, he maintains the site Mutualist Blog, Free Market Anti-Capitalism, at mutualist.blogspot.com, and a set of resources related to mutualism at mutualist.org. Mary Ruart is an anarchist activist, author, and scientist. She is perhaps best known as the author of Healing Our World in an Age of Aggression, 3rd edition, 2005. She earned a B.S. in biochemistry and a Ph.D. in biophysics at Michigan State University before serving as a faculty member at St. Louis University and as a research scientist at the Upjohn Company. She has worked extensively with the poor through her decade-long efforts to rehabilitate low-income housing in the Kalamazoo area and was an active member of the Kalamazoo Rainforest Action Committee. She currently serves as chair of a for-profit independent review board based in Austin. Her internet column, Short Answers to the Tough Questions, is a popular feature on the Advocates for Self-Government website, www.self-gov.org. Murray N. Rothbard was an economist, political theorist, and historian. He was the author of such books as Man, Economy, and State with Power and Market, 2009, the Ethics of Liberty, 1982, and An Austrian Perspective on the History of Economic Thought, 1995. He played a key role in efforts during the mid-1960s to link the anti-interventionist, anti-authoritarian Old Right with the New Left in opposition to the Vietnam War and the draft. Pierre-Joseph Proudhon was a philosopher, social theorist, activist, and member of the French Parliament. Arguably the first person to use the self-description anarchist, Proudhon was the author of many influential books, including What is Property? 1840, The System of Economic Contradictions or the Philosophy of Misery? 1846, General Idea of the Revolution in the 19th Century? 1851, Theory of Property? 1866, and Of the Principle of Art? 1875. Roderick T. Long is a senior fellow of the Mises Institute. He is currently professor of philosophy at Auburn University and president of both the Molinari Institute and Molinari Society. He holds a Ph.D. from Cornell University and a B.A. from Harvard. He is the author of Reason and Value, 2000, and Wittgenstein, Austrian Economics and the Logic of Action, 2011, and the co-editor, with Tibor Makan, of Anarchism slash Minarchism, is a government part of a free country? 2008. He blogs at aaeblog.com. Rosa Slobodinsky was the pen name of Rochelle Slobodinsky Yaros, a 19th and 20th century physician and activist who was involved at various points in feminist and anarchist struggles. Her partner was the sometime anarchist theoretician Victor Yaros. She was the author of Women and Sex, 1933. Roy A. Childs, Jr. was a political theorist, historian, and journalist who served as the editor of the Libertarian Review from 1977 to 1981. He was especially well-known as an incisive book reviewer. Many of his essays are available in a posthumous collection, Liberty Against Power, 1994. Sean P. Wilbur is an anarchist theorist, historian, publisher, and bookseller. He blogs at libertarian-labyrinth.blogspot.com and maintains an enormous array of resources related to the history of anarchism at libertarian-labyrinth.org. Sheldon Richman is the editor of The Freeman, Ideas on Liberty, and the author of books including Tethered Citizens, 2001, and Separating School and State, 1994. He blogs at sheldonfreeassociation.blogspot.com. Voltairine de Clare was a feminist and anarchist writer and speaker who defended anarchism without adjectives. Collections of her essays and speeches include The Voltairine de Clare Reader, 2004, Exquisite Rebel, The Essays of Voltairine de Clare, Anarchist, Feminist, Genius, 2005, and Gates of Freedom, Voltairine de Clare and the Revolution of the Mind, 2005. 
William Gillis is an anarchist activist and theoretician in Portland, Oregon. He holds a bachelor's degree from McAllister College. Thank you for listening to the audiobook version of Markets, Not Capitalism, edited by Gary Chartier and Charles W. Johnson. This audiobook was narrated and produced by Stephanie Murphy. Contact information and how to support this project can be found in the track tags. If you enjoyed this free audiobook, please support the narrator, producer, and authors. This concludes the audiobook.